Thank you very, very much. I'm delighted for the privilege of being able to speak to you. I want to try to do one of the most difficult things there is in human life. I want to try to motivate you. Now, if any of you know anything about motivation, you know it's probably the hardest thing to do with a human being. How does a parent, for example, motivate his or her child? How does a coach motivate his football team? How does a businessman get his salesman to do what he wants him to do? How does a preacher motivate a congregation? Well, when you begin to think about it, you realize that this is one of the hardest things that there is in human life, to motivate somebody. And yet, you and I both know it's the difference. For every one Olympic champion, there are a hundred thousand boys or girls who could be Olympic champions. For every great salesman, there are a hundred thousand who could be great salesmen. For every artist or painter or great professional leader in any capacity, there are a hundred thousand people who could have been great. The difference is motivation. Now, I can't even tell you what motivation is. I've read 50 psychology books trying to find out what motivation really is comprised of, and yet I haven't found a single definition that is adequate. I feel just a little bit like Knut Rockney, this great football coach from the University of Notre Dame. A businessman called him up from South Bend to his office in Chicago, and he said to him, Knut, tell us how you motivate your football players, how you get those guys to come from behind and win ball games. And Knut wasn't very much at ease in this great big plush office. And he said, well, sir, what we do is we just talk about football. We talk about how you got to give and take, how you got to put out. And the businessman said, yes. And Knut Rockney said, well, actually, what we do is we talk about the fighting Irish, the Notre Dame heritage, the, the Gipper. We talk about the four horsemen. And the businessman, nonplussed, said, yes. And finally, Knut said, actually, what we do, sir, we tell these guys, you got to get out there on that field and you got to fight, you got to fight, you got to fight, fight, fight. And the businessman jumped over the desk, grabbed Rockney and said, send me in, coach, I'm ready to play. <laughs> well, that's what I mean by motivation. It isn't something you can define. It's something that happens to a person. They begin to act like the track coach who had four boys on his relay team and they weren't putting out the way he thought they ought to put out. So he substituted for the baton a loaded stick of dynamite. And as the third man was handing off this loaded stick of dynamite to the fourth man, the fourth man taking his right hand, running like mad, he blazed down the straightaway into the tape, and the coach was there, and he had this watch, and he nudged Waldo, his assistant, and said, Waldo, I told you those guys could run that in under three minutes. <laughs> well, you see, that's motivation. Now, that's what I'd like to try to do with you. I want to motivate you. I want to get you to act. I want to get you to use your abilities. I'm confident that I'm speaking to someone right now that is capable of great things in life. And if I can just inspire you or motivate you, I'm sure you can do what you ought to do. Now, to do so, I want to speak to you out of the world that I know the best, this rough, tough world of athletic competition. So let me borrow from the sport world some of these little experiences that I've seen believing that out of these little experiences, you can see the crisis of your own life. You can see a simple answer to your own life. You can see the kind of emotion and drive that you need to motivate you. And the first thing I want to say is this. There comes a time in the sport world and in life when you've got to take a chance, when you can't play it safe. There comes a moment when you've got to put your neck out, so to speak, on the block. When you've got to take a tremendous chance, you don't know all the answers, you give yourself to something believing you can pull it off. Now, I'm not talking about a wild, risque gamble. Not too long ago, I went through Las Vegas and I watched people pulling the slot machine. You ever see them? The handles on those slot machines, you talk about fitness. This is fantastic. <laughs> they'll pull until their right arm gets tired and then when their right arm gets tired, they'll start using their left arm and they'll pull and pull and pull waiting for some lucky break to change their life, for some circumstance in life to alter them. I don't mean that kind of gamble. I mean where you put yourself into it. I mean where you do something about it, an intelligent risk where you use your mind, pierce as far as you can into reality, and when you can't see through the darkness, you give your life to it. The sport world rings with this kind of phenomena. You take pro football, these guys, the seconds ticking away, they're behind in a ball game, a guy will go back, he'll, he'll hit a guy with a 50-yard, 60-yard pass in the end zone in the last remaining second to win a ball game. Well, this 
is beautiful because it portrays the story of life. A football player going back, kicking that field goal with less than three seconds left to play, and it goes through the uprights as the roar of the crowd goes up. That is living. These professional football players make the game so exciting because they are used to risk. They take the chance. I think of Arnold Palmer, the great golfer. They ask him why it was he took a 10 on a certain hole in the L.A. Open and he lost the championship. And the reporter asked him this, said, why didn't you play it safe, Arnold? And Arnold turned to this young boy and said, let me tell you something, son. You don't win big championships by playing it safe. He said, if I'm behind a tree, I go through the tree. He said, I found out this. There's a 50-50 chance you can get through that tree. When I go up to a ball, he said, I can't think to myself, I got to play it safe. If I've got to slice it or hook it, I've got to hit that shot precisely where I want it to go. You can't win big championships taking it easy, son. You've got to go for it. Well, that's why this guy can put four or five birdies together under pressure in the last few minutes or last few holes to win a tremendous tournament. Why? Because he takes the chance. I submit to you, friends, that this is a reality that we're going to have to live with in America. We live in an age of risk. It isn't easy. You can't fall on the ball. You can't play it safe. We've got to use our imagination. We've got to reach out. I think of John Glenn, this tremendous guy when he went up into orbit 18,000 miles an hour around the globe. Just before he went up, a couple of days before, a reporter said to him nervously, John, what are you going to do if your retro rockers don't go off? And John Glenn looked at the guy and smiled and said, you know, it's going to spoil my whole day. <laughs> well, that's the kind of a spirit that is putting us back in the space race. The kind of a spirit that made America, where men take chances. Of course, it's a risk. Of course, the retro rockets might not go off. But that's why men do great things. They take the chance. America was built on this kind of a psychology. People who left the security of the old shores and they came to America because they took a chance on liberty. They died before they were 30. They fought Indians. They were half starved to death. But these men and women were willing to take the chance, the supreme chance of life itself for liberty. Our country, our economics was built on this kind of a philosophy where men would lose everything and begin again. They'd build a great industry, they'd lose it, and then they'd build another one. That's why we have the greatest economy in the world. Now, we're bartering this away in this myopic socialism which says, don't take a chance anymore. We'll take care of you. Let us plan your life from the cradle to the grave. You won't have to take any risk. The state is the answer to all your problems. The state will take care of you. We're bartering away the most precious thing we've got in America today, our freedom because we're trying to eliminate risk. Friends, you cannot have freedom without risk. You cannot have progress without risk. You've got to be willing to take a chance. And before you think I'm just talking lacy fair politics, can I tell you the greatest risk ever taken in the history of the universe was when God made a man, put him on the globe, gave him a mind and a will and said, now live your own life, think your own thoughts. When God did that, he took a supreme chance on human beings. I don't know about you, but I'm here today because someone took a chance on my life. A young minister who believed in me when nobody else did. I submit to you, friends, that there isn't a person here of greatness, but what someone has taken a chance on their lives. You can't escape risk in life. Marriage is a risk. The vocation you select is a risk. In the international situation in which we find ourselves, we are going to have to live with risk. You've got to take chances. But number two, you must expect to fail. Now, I know this is a hard thing to say to anybody. You've got to fail. It's impossible to live life without failing. You see, we like the opposite. We, we like to pick up a book on the newspaper stands, How to Be a Success. And incidentally, if you want to make a lot of money, write a book on How to Be a Success. Everyone wants to succeed. But what most of these books forget, friends, is the hard reality that in order to succeed, you've got to fail. Failure is the road to success. I maintain this, that it's 75% failure for every 25% success in life. Those guys who step up to the plate in big league batting, don't they go out about three out of four times? They only hit about one out of four times. It's the superlative batter who goes much beyond that. The guys who hit the home runs, we like to talk about them, but, you know, they strike out about three times for every one home run that they hit. 
You analyze some of these great players and sportsmen, you'll discover they wallow through failure in order to get the dramatic moment. Jesus saw this about human life when he said, the seed will fall on four types of soil. Three types of soil will not bear fruit. Only one kind of soil is good soil. You discover this in human life and it's fantastic. About 25% of the people will assume responsibility regarding life. 75% will just drift along in mediocrity. They won't seize the opportunities. They won't do what they have to do. You've got to expect failure. You see what I mean? You go through failure in order to harden yourself for the victory. I watched a boy named Frank Budd blaze into the tape to hit it in nine and two tenths seconds in the 100 yard dash in the national championships. Randall's Island, New York. Everyone roaring their approval. A new world record. Frank Budd was so happy. I was interviewing him on television. And I said, Frank, this is a little bit different from Rome, isn't it? Very few people knew what I was talking about. But in Rome, the year before, Frank Budd had failed to get the baton to Ray Norton in time. He had wavered for a split second. And in the waiver, Ray Norton went out of the exchange area. And the Americans lost four gold medals and a world record because of his failure. Well, in the roar of the crowd, Frank sobered for a minute when I asked him, it's different from Rome. And he said this, Bob, you've got to go through Rome before you can appreciate a moment like this. Rather profound psychology for a 20 year old boy. But do you see what he's driving at? You've got to go through failure before you'd even appreciate success. The people who want success upon success upon success, what they fail to realize is that you wouldn't even appreciate it if you had it. You've got to fail before success has meaning. Would I shock you if I said to you the greatest thing happening to America today is failure. In failure, we're beginning to find ourselves. You can't just win a nation by doling out a million dollars. You've got to stand for something, principle, belief. Well, America's beginning to realize this. Nels Ferre put it beautifully when he said this, failure is God's shock treatment to bring a man to a new realization of himself, a new evaluation of himself. In failure, America's beginning to come back. May I say to you that some of the greatest saints for God have been men who have failed utterly. And God has been able to take them in their failure and their weakness and, and make them strong. Don't be afraid of failure, friends. It's the process by which you get to the goal of victory and success. Thirdly, though, and this one fits right in with the other aspects of motivation, you will be as big as you think you can be. Now, I know this sounds like a sweeping generalization. You'll say to me, you mean I can be anything I want to be, Bob? I say to you, you can. Now, before you deny me, let me tell you a few sports stories of what I've seen kids do as I've stood by unbelieving and watched them accomplish the impossible. I was in Champaign, Illinois once. I gave a speech about the Olympic Games and I said, who knows but what there's an Olympic champion right here in this auditorium. Well, I didn't think too much about it, signed a few autographs and left. Two years later, I went to Rome. I watched kids battling for the championship of the world. I watched Lance Larson lose by a flick of the finger into the end of the pool. That's how much he lost by. I watched Sam Hall on one dive, he went up, went into a spin, hit the board, wavered for a split second, went into the water. He lost the championship of the world by three tenths of a point. You talk about pressure. In the Olympics, there's fantastic pressure. Well, I watched this boy from America named Mulligan. I didn't know what town in America Mulligan was from, but he was battling against this kid from Australia. There was hardly a molecule of water between them. That close, the roar of the crowd, lactic acid in their muscles. These guys tired, worn out. Six yards, four, two. In the last yard, Mulligan lunged out to barely beat this kid from Australia. Well, I was so excited about a minute later, I ran down, threw my arm around Mulligan. I said, Mulligan, that was tremendous. And this big old kid looked down at me, threw his arm around me and said, Hey, Bob, did you know I was from Champaign, Illinois? I about fell in the pool. That boy, what I said superficially, he believed. Two years later, he was the champion of the world. Do you see what I mean? You can be as big as you think you can be. He thought of himself as an Olympic champion. Two years later, he was an Olympic champion. Let me tell you another one. I was in Long Beach, California, had a church down there. I used to go around in Sunday school classes talking about great champions I knew. And in a little class of girls, nine, 10 years of age, 
I was telling about some champions and a 10 year old girl jumped up right in front of me, little curls bobbling on her head and she said, Bob, I wanna be a great tennis champion. Well, I actually felt embarrassed for this little girl. And I put my hand on her head and I said, Billy, I sure hope you can be a champion. And I kinda eased the way for her to sit down. I thought it was just an impulsive moment. It would pass and she'd go on like all the other little girls and go to college, maybe have a few children. But do you know, imagine my surprise when I picked up the newspaper and read that Billie Jean Moffat of Long Beach, California was the fourth ranking amateur women's tennis player in the world. Imagine my surprise when she scored the biggest upset in Wimbledon. Imagine my surprise when I found out that with Suzanne Sussman, she won the doubles championship of the world. You see, she was as big as her challenge. That little curly haired 10 year old girl got a dream. She began to reach out for it. You think this is impossible? A 10 year old boy in Fargo, North Dakota said, I'm gonna play on a winning Rose Bowl team. Now, what are the chances of a 10 year old boy playing on a winning Rose Bowl team? Well, he played on one Rose Bowl team and they were beaten. But January 1, 1962, Dave Mulholland of Fargo, North Dakota played on a winning Rose Bowl team. You see, people are as big as they think they can be. You'll forgive this personal reference, but in Oslo, Norway, I went over a crossbar at 14 feet, six inches. Now this is before fiberglass poles, I better tell you that. But anyway, coming down like a flash of lightning, like thunder, it dawned on me these ideas. I can be an Olympic champion. I can't tell you what it is. This idea that you can do it, this belief, this faith, this something. But I can tell you it gives meaning to every sprint down a runaway. You work harder, you begin to lift weights, you begin to train like you've never trained before because you believe you can do it. Now I'm aware of the fact that there are 100,000 boys in America bigger than I am, stronger than I am, faster than I am. They could have beaten me, I know this, but I know that the determining factor of life is not so much ability, but what you think you can do. I'm positive that I won a gold medal in the Olympics primarily because I believed I could win a gold medal in the Olympics. It's the greatest power in life. Look at it from the negative point of view. What chance would you have given a guy walking down the streets of Vienna, Austria, of taking over Germany? Here was this beraggled guy, frustrated, deranged in mind, mad at everybody. In prison, he wrote a book called Mein Kampf, My Struggle. What he was gonna do with the world, with the Jews? People laughed because they said, why this idiot, he'll never take over Germany. 60 million people lost their lives in trying to stop that guy from accomplishing his ends. He believed he could do it. And while good people were sitting by, Adolf Hitler took over the Third Reich. You can be what you wanna be. It works for evil as well as good. Think of this little pipsqueak of a guy, Lenin, walking into Moscow, Russia, and he said, I'm gonna take over Russia. Here was Kerensky and all the socialists. Here were the intelligentsia, Sorokin, all the great big guys, the army, the navy, the czar. Lenin with a few hardcore Bolsheviks said, I'm taking over Russia. And he did. And the chaos of the world today because he did accomplish just that. A man can be what he wants to be. And while good people are saying it can't be done, evil men are doing it because they believe they can. I think, for example, of one lone man who stepped on a Grecian shore and he said, I'm gonna win this world to Christ. Well, the Greeks said, why you fool, we'll outthink you, we'll outrationalize you, we'll outreason you. So this little guy stepped on the Roman shore and he said, I'm gonna win this world to Christ. And the Romans laughed even harder. They said, why, we'll squash you with one little thumbprint. And yet 100 years later, the Greco-Roman world was won to Christ because Paul believed that it could be done. I submit to you, friends, that the world belongs to the people of faith, to the people who believe they can do it. The future belongs to young men and women who will believe it and who will pay the price of making their dreams come true. And lastly, dedication is more important than ability. If you really want to be motivated, you've got to dedicate your life to something. You've got to commit yourself to something. Now I know we're prone to think that what really makes greatness in living is, is a fellow with fantastic ability. 
a seven-foot basketball player, a 280-pound football player. And that's what makes for greatness. It's the ability, the God-given inheritance. I don't deny that. I'm aware of the fact that a man's ability is important. But more important than ability is the dedication of your life. The dedicated person will go beyond the person of ability. When Peter Snell broke the world mile record of 354.1, everyone was amazed because the newspaper account said that he ran 15 miles home to tell his mother about it. That shouldn't have shocked anyone because Peter Snell runs 20 miles per day. This fellow who holds the mile record also holds the half mile record. He broke the half mile record by 17 yards, not by a tenth of a second, not by a quarter of an inch, but by 17 yards. But you want to know the answer? 20 miles per day. There are people that are listening to this speech who could break Peter Snell's record. But do you want to know how you do it? 21 miles per day. These records don't come easily. They are the product of fantastic dedication, of thousands of hours of work. You can stretch your ability. You can stretch your mental capacity. You can stretch your physical capacities. You can stretch every aspect of your being if you are dedicated and give your life to something great. I close with this one last story, a story that takes place in Moscow, Russia, in Lenin Stadium. The United States of America had come over there to meet the Russians in a dual track meet. You talk about a symbol of the world's struggle. Here it was, hardly a point separating them. Athletes from these two great nations battling right down to the wire, sprinting into the tape, jumping, throwing, competing for the glory of their nation. Well, there were two boys battling for the high jump championship of the world. Here was John Thomas, six feet, five inches tall. Here was Valerie Brumel, six feet one. Which one would you pick? to jump seven feet, four and a half inches in the air. The crossbar was set at a new world record. John Thomas tried his first jump, couldn't get over it. Valerie Rommel went over it three inches, dropped on it, the crossbar shimmied off. John Thomas tried his second jump, still couldn't make it, it shimmied off. Valerie Rommel went over it four inches, landed on top of the crossbar, it bounced off again, and then a torrential rain hit Moscow. Tons of water dropped out on that stadium. You couldn't even see across the stadium. The rain was so heavy. 35 minutes later, drenching wet, I said over the microphone, no one's going to jump anything in this. The takeoff was nothing but mud. But the boys up in the booth said, we've got to go ahead and get the last jump. So they went ahead with the competition. One last jump left. 65,000 Russians poured back into the stands. John Thomas tried his last jump, slipped, couldn't quite get over it. It was a good effort under the conditions before he got out of the sawdust. Walking about three steps, they put the crossbar back up. 35 yards back, I saw Valerie Brumel running with fire in his eyes. Have you ever seen fire in a man's eyes? Dedication so determined that he's got to do it regardless of anything. I saw fire in Valerie Brumel's eyes. I watched him as he went through the puddle, sprinting like mad as he hit the takeoff. <clears throat> he went over the crossbar five inches. And I listened to that Russian roar for 15 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. You want the story? When Valerie Brumel was 12, he said, I'm going to break the high jump record for the glory of my nation. Seven consecutive years without being out of shape, one single day. At the age of 19, he broke the world's record. That's what I mean by dedication. They're dedicated. 24 million kids training for the glory of a nation. Their students are studying 16 hours a day. They're turning out 15 times as many engineers as we are, 10 times as many teachers, seven times as many doctors. They are more dedicated to a wrong cause than we are to a right cause. Dedication made America. This great nation is what it is because people sacrificed. They worked. They were willing to give themselves to something beyond themselves. There is more to life, friends, than a country club existence, four wheels, and a good time. And if America is ever going to be the nation it ought to be, we're going to have to start saying, I'm going to put out more and more as I receive less and less now the attitude seems to be, give me more and more as I put out less and less.
But if we're going to go on in history as the great nation, we're going to have to rediscover dedication. And I say that unless we discover it, we will go down in the dust of time. The dedicated nation rises while the non-dedicated nation goes down. I think of that Moscow Lenin Stadium. I remember a boy doing push-ups. All the Russians had gone. There was nobody in the stadium now. John Gutnik from America was out there doing push-ups. He had been beaten by the Russian Bolotnikov. And as he was doing these push-ups, I went up to him and I said, John, what are you doing? He said, I'm doing push-ups, Bob. And I said, yeah, I know I can see that, but, but why? He looked up at me with the salt running into his mouth, tired and worn out, and he said, Bob, I was beaten today. I'm not going to be beaten the next time I meet Bolotnikov. You want the secret in space? You want the secret in the Olympics? You want to build a spiritual life, a home, a community, a nation? The kingdom of God. Here it is, friends. Dedication. Dedication. Thank you very much.